our gospel readings in the lectionary seem to move very quickly from Christmas, very quickly through Christmas to Jesus, baptism and, and then the start of his ministry. There is a pace and an urgency about the way that they are written. As there is in the gospel accounts themselves, there is a, a pace and an urgency to, to get to the meat of the story. These are not simple biographies giving us all the information we might expect to read. These are gospel accounts, the good news of God revealed through these words to all. And so John's gospel tells us of how quite quickly Jesus begins to call his team together, the disciples, the apostles. In fact, the story has begun in the verses before we, uh, we've just read with, uh, first of all, the call of, uh, of Andrew and of Simon Peter. Um, and now we move on to the story of Philip and Nathaniel. There's very little detail given. We're not told much of their mood and their motivation. But there is a common theme between both these stories of call. And the common theme is in the words, come and see. There's an ambiguity in come and see. There's partly something as simple as come and have a look at this guy. Come and have a look at this man. Come and have a look at what he's doing and what he's saying. But I think there's something bigger in those words too. Come and have your eyes opened. Come and see. The world as it truly is for the first time. Come, come and see. Do you remember we're still in the period of Epiphany, that, that time of the Christian year where we speak of, of God's revelation, of God's opening of eyes. Come and see. Nathaniel seems rather skeptical. Uh, he sounds a bit grumpy, actually. You know, can anything good come from Nazareth? I, I've only lived here for the best part of eight years, and I'm not quite sure what the local Essex equivalent of Nazareth is, which is probably a good job. Yeah, but that place where, whenever you think of it, it's usually trouble rather than good. Can anything good come from Nazareth? And... Philip says to him, come and see. And Nathanael encounters Jesus. And Jesus tells him, I've seen you. It's an odd little story, isn't it? I mean, what, why, why so excited about the fact that he was seen under the fig tree before Philip spoke with him? Is this some sort of revelation of psychic ability. I mean, it doesn't seem likely, does it? So much as something that enables Nathaniel to know that Jesus truly sees him, understands him, gets him. On a reasonably regular basis, I meet uh, over Zoom for the last year or so with um, someone who is my pastoral supervisor. Do you know what? I've been in ministry so long that I think when I began, they hadn't even invented pastoral supervision. It's, it's loosely based on the, the sort of thing that any professional counsellor or psychotherapist will have their supervisor, someone that they are accountable to, someone that they will offload to. And that idea came into Christian ministry in recent years and has been much uh, recommended by our Baptist Union. And I meet on a reasonably regular basis with my pastoral supervisor. And there is a moment in most sessions 
where my heart skips. And it's when they say to me, and I'm, I'm sure it's just something that they've been taught to say, or maybe that they don't even know that they're saying in quite the way they say it. But my supervisor will say, I hear you. Like I say, it might be a clever technique of language. But you know what? There's something within me that responds, that skips when I am heard. When someone understands, when someone gets me. I wonder whether there's something of that happening here for Nathaniel. Certainly, that simple little statement is enough for him to realize that this is someone special. He has come to see, and he sees. Nathaniel has come, and he sees as he is seen. And Jesus promises him that he will see far greater things. Jesus speaks in language um, that would have been recognizable as prophetic and apocalyptic language of the, the angels descending upon the Son of Man in all his glory. But Nathaniel, Nathaniel has seen already there is something special about this Jesus of Nazareth. He has seen, he is seen, he comes to see. Our Old Testament passage paired with this tale of calling is a, another familiar story of calling. I, I'm, I'm convinced that many of us will have colored in um, Sunday school pictures of Eli and Samuel in the temple. It's a, it's a lovely story. But it's, it's not actually quite as cozy a story as we sometimes remember it. Or, or rather, there were perhaps elements that were missed out in some of our Sunday school stories. Because Eli is rather a complex character. Eli is old but he's lost control. His sons are consorting with prostitutes in the temple. Eli himself, when he first encountered Samuel's mother, assumed she was drunk. The passage begins by saying that the word of God was rare in those days. Something has been lost. Something is missing. And it's into this confused and rather unseemly world that God's voice speaks through the innocence of a young child. And we know the story of the, the repetition of, uh, of Samuel hearing the voice of God and assuming it was Eli and going to see Eli and Eli sending him away with a flea in his ear. You, you know the way the story is repeated until Eli suddenly realizes that there might be more to this than he is seeing, more to this than he is understanding. And so he sends Samuel away one last time and says, if the voice comes again, speak like this. Speak, for your servant is listening. Samuel hears the word of God. Samuel hears the word of God not simply as a personal call upon his life, although that element is there too. But Samuel hears the voice of God so that the nation of Israel and the person of Eli might hear the voice of God. That they might see how much has been lost, how much has gone wrong. The voice of God comes to Samuel. The next passage that follows on from this call is, 
is far from cozy. It's about how the judgment of God is coming on the house of Eli. This is not a cozy story of listening to God. It's a story of understanding how we need to look and see how God is at work in judgment as well as blessing. For God stands angered at the way that this world treats those who have nothing, those on the margins, those for whom his word should be good news and are somehow excluded from that word. So you hear the common themes in our two stories this morning. Come and see. Come and have your eyes opened. Come and hear. Listen for the voice of God. Speak for your servant is listening. Come and see. Have your eyes opened. Have your ears unblocked. We too are called as followers of Jesus, as disciples of Jesus, even as those who are sent out as apostles of Jesus. And it's good and proper that we talk about and learn together about what it means to be disciples of Jesus, what discipleship looks like, not simply going to church, but being a church. What is it that God is calling us to be and to do as God's church in this place? But it begins, it begins with come and see. Come and allow your eyes to be opened. Come and hear what God is saying. And so as we, at the early, in the early weeks of this new year, think about what serving God might look like in the year ahead, part of which I know is that desire to, to see some sense of return to norma normality, some, some sense of that opportunity again to mix and to minister to one another, some sense of that opportunity again to reach out to our neighborhood and our community. In this moment, are we listening for God's voice? Are we stilling ourselves? in preparation? Are we allowing God's voice to speak? And are we, are, are we responding to God's invitation to come and see? Not for the first time on a Sunday morning, I found myself reading the prayer from my friend Rachel Pullman, who uh, ministers with the URC up on Lindisfarne, Holy Island. Not for the first time I found myself reading her prayer for today and thinking, oh, wow, that is just what I was desperately trying to say. And she manages to say it in about 60 seconds worth of text. Let me read to you her prayer for the day as our prayer together at the end of this sermon. Standing still. From the expansiveness of the skies to the feathers of the sparrow, from the rhythms of the waves to the shoots pushing through the earth, from the timeless horizon to the shifting of the sands, we are called we are called to observe the constancy of change, the intricacies of creation, the complexities of life. We are called to be at one with ourselves, with all that is around us, and with God, our creator, 
our redeemer and our light. We are invited to inhabit spaces where clamor is calmed, questions paused, souls are fed. We are invited to become at home with change, with rebirth, and with hope. Friends, we are heard. We must listen. We are seen. May we see. Amen. Kevin.